good morning and a very warm welcome to Costa Capital's AGM, being broadcast live from Plus X Innovation Hub in Brighton. My name is Julie Capsalis and I was delighted to be appointed as the chair of Costa Capital in August of this year. It seems like much more than a year ago that many of us were together at our 2019 AGM at Epsom Downs Racecourse. I'm really sorry that we will not have a chance to talk to you all in person today, but I hope that this online event will still give us an opportunity to set out Coaster Capital's achievements and our focus and vision for the future. Before I start, however, I'd like to let you know some general housekeeping for today's event. It's really important to me that there's still an opportunity for discussion, debate and questions. We'll be utilising the chat and Q&A box to facilitate this and capture your thoughts. Coaster Capital team members and board members are also on the chat and will be engaging with you during the event to answer questions. We only have a limited time for questions for our panel, so please do upvote any questions you're especially keen to have answered, as this will help us focus on answering the questions where there's the greatest interest. Jonathan and I will do our absolute best to facilitate the Q&A using the chat with a number of questions that have also been shared with us in advance. The chat history and any unanswered questions will be reviewed after the event and we'll publish a full summary of answers on our website at a later date. Also to note that we're recording today's session and it will be made available on our YouTube channel and website for those of you who are unable to be here today or for those of you that enjoy it so much that you'd like to watch it again. Your microphones and videos will be switched off for the duration of the session. We'd like to encourage you to engage with the event through social media. You can tag Coaster Capital on Twitter and our hashtag is hashtag C2C AGM. Please do also follow us on social media and Twitter for regular updates and news. This is our first virtual AGM and I'd like to thank Platform 9 for their technical expertise, advice and patience in running today, along with Plus X. It's certainly very strange to be presenting to so many of you without being able to see you and gauge your reaction and responses, although maybe that might be a good thing. The past six months have been unlike anything any of us have ever lived through before. It's tested our resilience in business, communities, and personally. It's created some of the darkest of times, but set against determination, resilience, and extraordinary acts of kindness and community spirit. In my day job, I'm Managing Director of Chichester College Group, overseeing education and training for over 20,000 learners and customers. The day that we had to physically close our doors to all but a handful of vulnerable learners was one of the most challenging and difficult days of my career. Whilst absolutely necessary, it felt inconceivable and didn't exist anywhere on a risk register or a previous disaster recovery plan that we'd produced. Like so many of us, I found myself making business critical decisions on limited information, but with enormous consequences for our staff, students and stakeholders. One of my most significant challenges was repatriating large numbers of international students before borders closed. It was a daily challenge to see who we could get on flights and who would return from the airport after another flight was cancelled. One of my proudest moments was on the 23rd of March when I got our last two groups of students home, one to Japan and one to the Falkland Islands. And I was absolutely thrilled that last week I was able to welcome back students from the Falkland Islands to come and study in the UK. I know that all of you joining us today will have found yourself in some of the most challenging situations as well. On a daily basis, we were hearing of organisations that were having to close, repurpose and diversify. For me, working predominantly out of Crawley, I have been acutely struck by the disproportionate impact in the area. And as we come to the end of the furlough scheme, further challenges will lie ahead. But there is a resilience and a determination 
with partners including the airport, Gatwick Hotel Association, Manor Royal Bid, the Town Centre Partnership, the Council, politicians and so many others galvanised and working together to leverage support and investment. Crawley is a good example of where we're talking with one voice and the Crawley Growth Programme, part funded by Costa Capital, continues to make infrastructure improvements and enable physical regeneration. This programme will continue to unlock homes, employment space, reduce carbon emissions, improve cycle lanes, public realm regeneration, connectivity enhancement and developing Three Bridges Station. Earlier this month, the former Virgin site was sold for £30 million and the buyers noted that Crawley was still a key South East market for them. This is a welcome investment and an absolute vote of confidence in Manor Royal as one of the South East's premier employment hubs and business parks. Whilst undoubtedly significant challenges lie ahead, we must hold on to the assets that we have in our people and our places as it will be them that drive recovery and growth. One of the things that I've been hugely proud of was Coaster Capital's backing business fund, which we devised and launched in two weeks. We've invested two million pounds in 160 businesses, supporting their plans to adapt, evolve and innovate during COVID-19. This has included supporting breweries and restaurants, switch to online sales and home deliveries and investments in IT to enable companies to mobilise their workforces to work remotely. Two examples I wanted to share. Patterson Restorative Solutions create bespoke crowns, bridges, veneers and dentures for dentist customers. The shutdown prevented use of their laboratories and offices. They were awarded a grant to fund the purchase of home working equipment, a secure cloud-based system and a vehicle to collect uh, and deliver work that the technicians have produced at home and deliver them to surgeries. Brighton Gin gained funding to diversify their gin production to produce much needed hand sanitizer and also to develop an online business model to sell their gin directly to consumers, of which I'm now one. David Smith and his team at Costa Capital take huge credit for their work in setting up and delivering this grant with great speed and efficiency. What struck me in all of this was a sense of collaboration and partnership and support that I've never experienced in quite the same way before. I'm sure I'm not the only one who extended their attachment to Zoom to late night calls, for me probably with a glass of Brighton gin, talking to trusted groups of friends and colleagues about the enormity of the task ahead and the challenges of juggling childcare, homeschooling, shielding, looking after vulnerable relatives, furlough, and what at times felt like just surviving. For those of you who I've been on calls with over the last six months, that probably means that you've met both of my children. I never quite believed I could chair meetings while supporting an art class involving a staple gun, acrylic paints, lots of cardboard and a glue gun. You've probably all seen my spare bedroom I've given up with fancy backgrounds. There are two cats that regularly terrorise me and a very dodgy 1980s lampshade. But in a weird way, this has humanised us. I love the fact that I've admired people's pieces of art, chatted with their children and seen one naked person in someone's garden. We're all juggling. Different challenges, but juggling. What has made a difference is our support networks collaboration, understanding and kindness. For me, collaboration and partnership working is at the core of what we do at Coaster Capital. Today is testament to that. And when I look at the fantastic range of people that have joined us from the public, private and third sectors, covering our local authorities, SMEs, corporates, MPs, charities and business membership groups, I believe there are over 250 people on this call today. And if we work together for the region, we can enable change and support recovery for our businesses and communities. As I said at the start, Jonathan and I are at Plus X in Brighton today and what a fantastic facility. 
Whilst we all sat in two separate rooms, I can assure you we took some time over the weekend to coordinate our wardrobes for the day, which is something that seems so strange, having not worn a suit since the 20th of March. Plus X is one of our flagship local growth fund projects where we've invested over 7.7 million pounds. As we can't show you this fantastic facility in person today, I wanted to show some pictures and tell you a little bit about the investment. In 2015, Costa Capital awarded Brighton and Hove City Council funding to enable you and I developers to unlock the wider economic and social regeneration at Preston Barracks and to bring the previous military installation back to life as a place that will be rich with culture, community and opportunity. The ambition is to cement Brighton's position as one of the best places in the world to be an entrepreneur and an investor. The Plus X site is a seven storey purpose-built innovation hub, providing diverse and highly flexible workspace for a range of creative businesses. This is a unique offer that will allow business occupants to be provided with better access to funding, mentoring and more comprehensive support programmes, including linkages with the university. But the venue will also support the local community, including initiatives that will get occupants to mentor and assist young people and enterprise in the surrounding area. What's more, this site will create a gateway to the city and be a clear example of inclusive growth, where direct investment in the Preston Barracks site will benefit the surrounding community, increase economic growth through further site regeneration to provide jobs, community hubs, residential and student units. Plus X is the first building to complete in this scheme and it will be one of Brighton's largest ever regeneration projects. The scheme will establish the Lewis Road area as a thriving new academic and economic corridor into Brighton and it will also serve as a home for the University of Brighton's business school. To coincide with the launch of Plus X, there's a three-year business growth and innovation program that's been unveiled, BRIGHT, Brighton Research Innovation Technology Exchange, in partnership with the University of Brighton. This will bring over £10 million worth of support to hundreds of businesses in the area. The programme is funded through the European Regional Development Fund via Costa Capital and will provide businesses with a fantastic range of research and development including access to high-spec machinery and equipment, expertise, specialist design teams who can assist with prototype build and product development. I hope you'll agree that this is a really excellent example of the public and private sectors coming together along with higher education to unlock sites and provide transformational regeneration. I'm also assured that the site has super fast Wi-Fi so I'm crossing everything, there'll be no technical glitches from our end. So before Jonathan and I set out our plans and vision for the future, we need to cover the formalities of the AGM agenda. The minutes from the 2019 AGM can be found online and are approved here today. I'm also pleased to commend the annual report for 2019-20, which can also be found online. This includes a summary of our investments and interventions and some case studies of projects that we're really proud of, including our Enterprise Advisor Network, Growth Hub, Pioneering Banker in Residence and the local growth funds. The accounts for the year end the 31st of March 2020 were approved by the board at our meeting on the 9th of July and can also be found online. I'd also like to take this opportunity to confirm the Coaster Capital Board of Directors for 2020-2021 and thank the board members who stepped down over the past year. Having served on the board for six years and as vice chair for the last year, it is a great privilege to be appointed as chair. For me, one of the great appeals of being chair of Coaster Capital is the opportunity to work even more closely with our chief executive, Jonathan Sharrock. I believe Jonathan is one of the most dynamic, innovative and respective chief execs, both in the network and beyond. 
I'm also thrilled that Karen Dukes has stepped up to be my interim vice chair. Many of you will know Karen from her distinguished career, specialising in restructuring, due diligence, ethics, inclusion and transformational change. I also feel privileged to have an outstanding group of talented, experienced and passionate directors on our board. This slide shows our business representatives. Jamie Arnell, a partner at Charterhouse Capital Partners. Jamie is also a trustee at the Pebble Trust and chair of the Brighton Fringe. Martin Harris, our transport sponsor and managing director of Brighton and Hove Buses and Metro Bus. Martin also sits on the board of Transport for the South East and is trustee of the East Sussex Credit Union Foundation. Richard Hopkins, managing director of Fargrow Limited and chair of West Sussex Growers Association. He is also a CEO group member of the Agricultural Industries Confederation. Amanda Jones, Deputy Chief Exec and Director of Finance for Brighton Dome and Festival Theatre and Chair of our Audit Committee. She is also Chair of Sussex Past and a Trustee of Sam Moore Fund. David Joy is the Retired Chief Executive of London and Continental Railways. He's our housing sponsor with extensive experience working on joint regeneration ventures across the public and private sectors. Rosalind Laird is Director of HR and Governance at Age UK Croydon. Prior to that, she was Chief Executive at Chequers Contract Services. And Claire Mason, our SME representative and founder and CEO of award-winning thought leadership consultancy, Man Bites Dog. Claire is, a managing, is also Director at the Managing Partners Forum and an entrepreneur in residence at the British Library. Our local authority representatives also add enormous value and expertise to our board. Colin Kemp, Deputy Leader at Surrey County Council. Phelan McCafferty, Leader at Brighton and Hove City Council. Paul Marshall, Leader at West Sussex County Council. Tony Newman, Leader of Croydon Council. Mark Brunt, Leader of Reigate and Banstead Borough Council and Dan Humphreys, leader of Worthing Borough Council. And finally, our representatives from higher and further education. Francis Rutter, Chief Exec and Principal of Nescot and Chair of the Coastal Capital Skills Board. Fran is also representing all LAPS on the National Skills Group, reporting into the Local Economic Recovery Forum, chaired by government ministers. And Professor Jane Longmore, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Chichester and Chair of the University Vocational Awards Council. Since the last AGM, the following board members have stepped down and I'd like to personally thank them for their significant and valued contribution. Nancy Platts, former leader of Brighton and Hove City Council. Adam Tickell, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sussex. Mike Leroy, Vice President at American Express and long serving chair of our audit committee. And Daryl Gaylor and Louise Goldsmith, both founder members of the Coaster Capital Board. Louise herself was a driving force behind the establishment of Coaster Capital and former leader of West Sussex County Council. And Daryl led and chaired our investment committee for many years. And I'm hoping that he's going to be coming to work with us again using his expertise to develop our business grants programmes. Lastly, Tim Waits, who stepped down as chair in the summer, having completed his terms of office, including almost six years as chair. I'd like to pay tribute to Tim as a business leader, ambassador, philanthropist, and extremely supportive colleague and mentor. He has been such great support to me personally as well as to Jonathan and the whole board. He will be greatly missed and will always be a key part of the Coast Capital family. Thank you, Tim. Lastly, and to conclude the AGM, to note that the Coast Capital articles have been updated in line with our governance changes and can be found online. Now that the formalities of the AGM are over, I'd like to say a few words. Since being appointed as chair, I've been asked a lot about my vision, priorities, and what I'd like my legacy to be. First and foremost, it has to be to work with our partners 
to support the economic and social recovery and growth of our region. From a pandemic that was totally unexpected and has had a disproportionately significant impact on our region. We need to remind ourselves of the wonderful assets that we have in the region. Businesses, natural capital, heritage, culture, and more than anything else, people. It will be these assets that enable and drive our recovery and growth. But we must ensure that our recovery and future growth remains sustainable and inclusive. I want the LEC to continue to be more than just a funnel that distributes money. I want us to be transformational and innovative, to make bold decisions and invest in projects that would not get off the ground without us. I want us to provide strategic leadership, to work with our partners, to develop groundbreaking new projects and ideas. Jonathan will set out a number of these in his presentation, but I want us to do more to address challenges around social and economic regeneration. I want us to be best in class, to lead the way and instigate change. At our AGM last year, we talked about our work with the Rose Review into female entrepreneurship and being the first LEP to introduce a banker in residence. I'm so proud that based on the success of that, it has been rolled out across the LEP network. But we must do more to address equality and diversity. I am committed to looking to disaggregate our data to better understand where our investment and support goes and ensure that our support will be inclusive and wide reaching. I also believe we must do more to look at supporting social mobility and measure, measure social value in the projects we invest in. I want our investments to be innovative, inclusive and transformational. I want us to maximise the impact of our strategy and investments to achieve the best possible outcomes for local people and communities. We must ensure that our resources deliver the best value for money. And this should include a commitment to sustainable procurement, protecting and enhancing the environment, promoting a microeconomy and social enterprise, tackling disadvantage and encouraging wide and diverse engagement with businesses and communities to identify a new and exciting pipeline of projects and partners. For the next generation, I want to ensure a brilliant future. I want the next generation to live, work and grow in a fantastic region. I want them to progress through a great education system and access great jobs, living in a region with enviable assets and a high quality of life, but with opportunities for all. Working in the education and training sector myself, it's critical that we work with schools, colleges, universities, training providers, businesses, local authorities, the job centres and others to address the challenges that COVID-19 has and will bring around unemployment and job displacement. We need to look at reskilling and upskilling quickly and ensure that this work aligns supply and demand to get people into jobs. Our region will bid for an Institute of Technology and partners are already coming together to support and promote the government's Kickstart Start scheme, which will provide employers with funding to create job placements for young people who are unemployed. Addressing the skills challenges will also require cultural change and looking at transferable skills, working across sectors with a better understanding of progression and career opportunities in sectors like horticulture, logistics, construction, and health and social care. My aim is to make Coaster Capital fit for the future. Our vision remains to ensure that Coaster Capital is a fantastic place to live, grow, and succeed. Over the next three years, I want us to be recognized nationally, regionally, and locally as providing innovative and respected leadership identifying strategic issues facing the economy and then expertly brokering solutions with our partners to support recovery and growth. And as I said earlier, I'm absolutely committed to ensuring that our delivery is transformational and inclusive. 
but we cannot deliver any of this on our own. It will require new and existing partnerships to come together, spanning the public, private and third sectors to make things happen. We'll need to continue to attract funding from central government through setting out a compelling ask and delivering on our promises. I'm committed to this way of working and look forward to working with all of you on how we can ensure the greatest impact for our investments, interventions and for our region. Thank you. I'm now going to pass over to the Coast Capital Chief Exec, Jonathan Sharrock, to set out his plans for economic recovery. Thank you very much, Julie, and uh, thank you very much for introducing me that way. I'm so delighted to see uh, more than 200 people on the call at the moment, and uh, really uh, great that everyone's given us their time this morning. I was going to share my screen seamlessly and talk you through some of the issues facing the company at the moment. Um, really, this is an opportunity to look back over the year that's just finished and talk uh, specifically about what's going to happen next and what the challenges are that we face. The first thing to say is it's, it's been a year like no other, not something that we expected when we, uh, when we were in Epsom last year for our AGM. And I am absolutely delighted at how well uh, Coastal Capital as an organization has responded to the challenge. What I really want to do before I go into any of the details is just pay tribute to my excellent team. I think people often think that Coastal Capital is bigger than it really is. We, we have just over 30 staff working from our offices in Crawley, uh, 30 really dedicated and hardworking people who are all on the call today. And I just wanna be really, really clear about my gratitude and thanks to all of them for everything that they do for us. And it has been a really successful year. I just wanna give you a, a real sense of how the organization has grown and changed in spite of the challenges of COVID. We began the year with government assessing our performance and, and confirming us as an ex exceptional in terms of how we operate as a LEP. LEPs are subject to really, really significant scrutiny by government because we spend public money and we do that really well. We've adapted to remote working at the drop of a hat um, and during lockdown, during six months of mostly working from home, the organisation's gone up several gears, implementing, developing, delivering whole new pieces of work that weren't in a business plan, finding the money to do so, and uh, really unlocking the talents of everyone in the organisation. We've engaged really closely with all our partners. Our Economy Watch strand is really successful in our blogging and social media, and that's allowed us to un unlock stories and insights from people all across the region, which I'll share with you in a second. And we're now beginning to think about recovery planning, about what happens next to the region and how we work with government to maximize investment and support in our regional economy. I wanted to give you a sense of, of how we're presenting that argument. Clearly, COVID is an issue across the whole country. There are many regions which are affected and our role in the lab is to make sure that, that this um, area gets a really, really good hearing, a high profile and a successful interaction with, with the government in order to get proper investment and attention for us. We began the year having just completed our evidence base for our local industrial strategy. And we had a really clear sense of where the region's economy is strong, how we fit into the national e economic picture. Clearly the headlines in that are very positive and everyone who lives and works in the region understands its assets. But we also got a really clear sense of the structural weaknesses in the economy. As part of the southeast, it's easy to just assume that everything is rosy in this area, but, but we uh, all know that that's not the case. And the evidence base that we gathered really helped understand that. Uh, five or six really significant weaknesses in our area. The first is an over-reliance on, on Gatwick and London as a source of jobs. We were becoming too dependent on those places for, for, for work, particularly higher paid, higher skilled work challenges for our businesses in the region many many fantastic small and medium small and micro businesses in the region but we weren't providing a strong enough environment for those small businesses to grow and obviously as businesses grow and scale they really add value to the economy we weren't doing that well enough we weren't investing in our towns well enough and the feedback from many of our businesses was that many places in the coastal capital area just weren't compelling enough as places to invest um, and, and places to draw a talented workforce to we have a big problem with house prices. In 2016, 
the government's housing white paper said we were the most expensive region in England, and that's got worse since then. And we also feel that house prices starting, are starting to change the demographics of the region. So we were quite um, surprised to find that when you look at the population structure of the region, there's a material gap in the number of 20 and 30 somethings in the region. So that younger working population who might live here when they're students, they might grow up here when they're children, they're not choosing to put down roots and uh, stay in the region in the numbers that they should. And we were really worried about the impact that would have on our competitiveness in the medium term. Similarly, a skills gap in some places, and I'll come on to skills later on in the, in the presentation. And then COVID hit. And the region, the impact of COVID on our region is still to be fully understood. Clearly there's statistics coming out of the government, the Bank of England um, on a weekly basis, but we do believe that the region is disproportionately impacted by COVID. We published on Friday a very significant piece of work prepared for us by Hatch, our consultants, which gives an updated evidence base on how COVID has affected the economy. And I commend that to everyone on the call. Hope you'll have a look at it. And, uh, and start to talk about some of the issues it uncovers. The headline recommendation from Hatch, or headline advice from Hatch, is that they expect our economy to drop probably more than the national economic figure does. A 12 to 7, 10% drop this year is assuming there is no second national uh, lockdown. And it's uh, looking at the way that the Office of Budget Responsibility forecasts growth in the whole country and applying it to our region. As a particular challenge, in the Gatwick Diamond. So in East Surrey, in West Sussex, the places where the economy has grown up around the airport because Gatwick is having a, a very significant set of problems. Growth at Gatwick is gonna be significantly depressed for the next five years. And that is gonna have a major impact on, on jobs. And we expect that to become even more clear as the furlough starts to unwind in the next few weeks. But um, you know that's also felt in many other parts of the region, in the coastal communities, in West, the rest of West Sussex and in Brighton and Hove. During lockdown, there were some signs that that economy was starting to bounce back. The tourism sector had a very good summer. Amazingly, 15, um, 1,500 businesses were created in the region during lockdown. So very significant sort of uh, groundswell of entrepreneurialism where, where people are responding to challenges uh, by creating their own businesses. And so it's not a completely bleak picture but I don't want to leave you in any doubt that COVID is going to have a very significant impact on the region. We do have optimism that the region is well placed to recover. We, we do believe that our fundamental strengths, the size of our economy, the fact that we've grown above the national average for the last 10 years should put us in a very good position. But we need to think again about what the, uh, the basis of our regional growth is going to be. So Coastal Capital is setting out our vision uh, for infrastructure investment in the region based on building back stronger, building back smarter, and building back greener. And I just want to share the headlines of that with you now, because this will be our narrative uh, in our dialogue with government over the next few months. Turning first to the economy uh, around the airports, we absolutely need to look at this whole area from Epsom and Leatherhead in the north down to Haywards Heath in the south. All of these towns, and which no matter where they sit in terms of political geography, are all part of the same local economy, which is uh, a, an economy that's performed extremely well for the last 20 or 30 years based on a growing Gatwick Airport. Now that growth is going to be deferred, as I say, for quite a long period of time. So our, our vision is of rebooting this economy, broadening the uh, range of employment that's there, and taking decisions and finding investment that will bring other high quality, high skill employers into the region, into Crawley, where there's going to be a very significant impact and into all of the other towns as well. Our vision is that this should be seen on a national level as a commercial hub. The connectivity of this area is uh, second to none outside London. You know, we have global connections through the airport. We have a brand new railway station at Gatwick Airport being built at the moment. And we have uh, very significant uh, transport links between all these towns. It creates a network of places with huge potential. And we're very, very keen to support all of the local authorities in their vision for growth on a local area. We look forward to working with them all in terms of future projects to bring their, bring their towns forward and making sure that we get proper public investment in infrastructure to back that up. We also need to think about where there might be a case for public sector support to, to help private investment come forward. 
to make sure that we're bringing major businesses in from overseas and from other parts of the UK into this region. The second strand of our vision is to build back smarter. And this is best applied looking at the coastal um, economy, whereas uh, Gatwick provides the gateway for, for transport and investment in the region, it's Brighton and Hove and Chichester where our universities are based, which provides a gateway to the region in terms of innovation. And down in this area, we've always had a highly entrepreneurial, very successful uh, economy, which is growing up around that research. For example, we've had a 5G center in Brighton for the last five years. Uh, it still feels like a new thing at a national level, but it's something that our region has already begun to adapt to. So we want to see that investment continue we want to see uh, support for the next sector coming through here, which is the quantum sector. Uh, Sussex University is a, a global leader in quantum technology. We want to support that sector growing in the city, get investment to make sure that, that Brighton's economy is regenerated on the back of that. And then to take that along the coast through Lansing, through Worthing, Chichester, and all the way to Bognor Regis, all of those places and others too are getting ready for this challenge. And it's really interesting, the amount of innovation space the amount of business support space and, and basically an economy geared to entrepreneurialism which is springing up in the coast. This is a unique asset for the country. We believe it's the most successful coastal community in the UK and we believe it needs proper attention and proper support from government to help it thrive. And then thirdly, we need to make sure that growth comes back greener. This is a bit of a no-brainer, you know, there's no future in the country for, for growth which isn't green. And we believe that our economy is very, very well placed to do that. You know, we, we, we have a number of assets. You can look at the sectors of the economy which are becoming best in class in terms of their sustainability. Many of them are in the transport sector, the buses, the airports, the railways, but many of them are in other sectors too. And there's some fantastic work being done in construction and in manufacturing about moving to a much more sustainable model. We also have a huge uh, offer in terms of offsetting, offsetting in terms of carbon, and offsetting in terms of natural capital. And it's been fascinating this week to see the national attention on biodiversity and the importance of protecting uh, all the different species that exist in the local area. We see that as very much an economic goal for the region because a region that's rich in biodiversity, that's rich in natural capital, is gonna be a desirable place that people are gonna to want to live in and uh, businesses are gonna to want to invest in. So it's something that we're fully supportive of. And then of course, as you can see from the picture, lots and lots of innovation happening, as you'd expect from our region, whether that's in terms of offshore energy, uh, solar panels, local generation, hydrogen vehicles, and all of these uh, sectors need to be supported, which the LEP has been proud to do for many years. Moving on from there, the next step is to uh, talk to ministers in the run-up to the budget before the end of the year, and to think about the investment that we need to back this up. So there's a very well-established case for investing in our railway, a major scheme at Croydon which will benefit the whole region. We want to see the Transport Secretary endorsing that within the next 18 months. And by the way, the Croydon economy growing in parallel with ours is a, is a story that we'll keep on telling because Croydon remains a gateway between our region and central London, something that will continue to develop in future. The second part of our infrastructure pitch is about digital infrastructure. We've invested massively in West Sussex and in Brighton in digital infrastructure and we're looking for similar projects, particularly in Surrey, to start to unlock the potential of all of our towns in, uh, in, in creating a 5G economy. We'd like the region to be the first 5G economy, the first fully connected economy in the country. We're doing that at a local level, we're doing that at a regional level, and we're doing that uh, at a wider level too. And Coastal Capital has been instrumental in creating Catalyst South as a voice for the wider Southeast in discussions with government. You have a Northern powerhouse, you have a Midlands engine, well, in Catalyst South, you have a LEP-led uh, gateway for government and politicians to understand the bigger trends in the southeastern economy. And that stretches all the way from the Solent and Berkshire, all the way across to Essex and Kent. And we're very much part of that. And then as the next few weeks and months go by, we're going to be working very hard with partners to develop projects which will um, be fundable, be deliverable, and can meet what the government wants to see in terms of its wider agendas. We, we set out some of those early ideas on this slide and, and over the next few weeks, we'll be working in partnership with everybody to come up with specific pipeline of projects that can be funded. Now, we've always been very good as a region at coming up with uh, interesting and innovative projects. And that feels very much like the order of the day for ministers. 
they're looking to take the national economy into a, a, a global uh, market, into a technologically uh, advanced position, and our region has a great deal to offer there. So you can see many of them listed there, and also on the next slide. Um, I'll pick up on many of these uh, themes in, my, in the rest of the presentation, but uh, also to say that as a lab, we, uh, we find uh, huge value in partnering with, with people from all different backgrounds, and that's not just the public sector. So we've had a number of very significant partnerships um, with companies in terms of how we access this funding. And for everyone on the call, if there are businesses out there who, who have ideas and believe that they can be applied across the whole area, we'd be very pleased to, to hear from you separately. Moving on, I just want to give a sense of, of how the economy looks more broadly in the sectors that, that we enjoy in this region. I've talked a little bit about the headline figures in response to COVID, um, but it's important to, to talk about how that works sector by sector. And one of the great things of our economy is it's very broad based. We're not reliant on any one particular sector. Uh, we've always been successful in a number of areas and, and that's been key to our resilience and growth in recent years. It's never been better illustrated than now. So at the moment, clearly the, the situation at Gatwick is uh, not what anyone expected and certainly not what anyone wants for the region's major employer. We shouldn't be in any doubt about the importance of Gatwick for the region. Gatwick's capital investment budget, about 250 million pounds a year for the last decade, which is one of the most significant sources of spending and investment in the whole region. Um, the airport operator is predicting that uh, the current low levels of traffic uh, are going to climb, but it's going to take five years for Gatwick to get back to what it was in 2019. So that's five years where we can't rely on the double digit growth that the airports brought us. And that puts a real challenge to the rest of the economy for other sectors to grow at a higher rate. If we're going to close the gap that I've already highlighted for you, then we're going to need all sectors of our economy to grow. And that's going to require some um, serious strategic thinking, and in some cases, some radical thinking about what we need to do to bring forward growth, investment, and development in order to make this a place for, um, for future investment. The good news is many of those sectors are here and doing really well, and the slide illustrates uh, the importance of the digital sector. So we have a very, very strong CDIT sector, which has continued to grow through lockdown as so much has moved online. We really want that to continue. And uh, some of the ways we're doing that include investing in a new innovation hub in Crawley, supporting the development of innovation centres in Bognor, in Brighton, in Chichester, and all over the region, uh, supporting new business park proposals like the Hawley Business Park, as well as other development ideas around the airport. And we want to see these business parks um, as places where growing medium-sized tech-based businesses will choose to come. We're delighted that Network Rail has just uh, issued a tender for a brand new um, fiber superhighway going from Victoria and London Bridge right the way down to the coast. It'll be the first one in the country and it'll provide us with a, a whole new set of capacity and tech infrastructure that businesses will be able to exploit. And some of those businesses are already very present in the area. So we have a huge viticulture industry coming forward. We have a very successful glasshouse industry illustrated on the slide. You know, as new technologies, as, as 5G technology starts to take off, there's huge scope for those sectors to grow and employ many more people, deliver much more wealth to the region. The tourism sector is also one of our um, great assets. It's had a very, very strong summer because uh, people haven't been able to fly, and we want to make sure that tourism continues to grow. That, that really challenges us on, is our brand good enough? Are people choosing to come to Sussex and Surrey rather than going to the Lake District and Cornwall? Have we got the right offer to the London market to make people come down? And when I say come down, I don't just mean for a day trip. I mean for people to decide to come and spend and invest in our area. And we're really excited by some of the work that's being done, particularly the Sussex Modern brand, which is emerging to help really drive and grow our area as a, as a, as a destination for tourism in the UK. We have a very strong cultural sector on the bottom right. That's the Chichester Festival Theatre. Unfortunately, not operating as we would like at the moment, but, but in Chichester, in Brighton, in the Horth, in the Fairfield Halls, we've got fantastic venues in this region and we want to see this sector back up and running. In Epsom, we have the University of the Arts, which is a, a, a national leader in terms of uh, creative industries. And we want to see all of these sectors coming forward and growing. And frankly, if we have a, a stronger cultural sector in the region, 
that will lift the, the spirit and the attractiveness of many of our towns and places and make them much more interesting and much more relevant to investors and people who are thinking about where to live. That's what we want to see to help this region move forward. And finally, last but not least, the really uh, significant manufacturing uh, sector that we have, a hugely innovative advanced manufacturing sector in this area. Companies like Sarah's Power, based in Horsham, but new offices in Mer uh, new factory in Merstham. We have Rolls-Royce Automobile, we have Ricardo, we have a number of others which are of national and international significance. So, you know, when we get it right, we bring um, really good medium sized and large businesses to the region. We want to do more of that. Hope that gives you a sense of where the economy is. It's, it's a hugely exciting economy. I think that's the key thing and one that we really want to uh, support going forward. And no better way to do that than by focusing on micro and small businesses, because as I've said, if, if these micro businesses aren't growing, we will never get the, uh, the scale of the economy that we need and we'll never get the growth to take us out of, uh, of the COVID slump. So Coast to Capital is um, the government's lead vehicle for doing this in the area. And we've had a fantastically successful year. Our growth hub is a very well-established brand now and has absolutely been um, at the front line when it's come to the challenges of COVID. Just to give you some, some flavor of that. And in the first quarter of the year, uh, we actually hit our, our annual target in terms of number of businesses supported. There was so much demand from small businesses out there just to help navigate the fog of lockdown. We supported 1300 businesses already this year and delighted that we've got a, a satisfaction rate of 93% in terms of those interactions. That's a very small team, but it's extremely successful and, and has very, very valuable links, whether that's with businesses themselves, with the FSB, with the chambers, with the bids all across the region. You know, these are partnerships that we constantly nurture in order to meet entrepreneurs across the region and, and help them. We have uh, a really, really strong story to tell about funding we've provided to. Julie mentioned our, our backing business grants, two million pounds of 100% uh, grants that we provided to businesses. We were the first uh, vehicle in the region to offer funding. We got there before government, we got there before local authorities, and we were able to, to support 160 businesses to adapt and innovate in response to COVID. There's some really, really good stories there, as Julie says, and we're delighted to have built relationships with those 160 small companies that we look forward to continuing. And I'm also delighted that we've launched a second round of that funding just a couple of weeks ago. So you'll find uh, our business recovery grants through our growth hub, through our website. That does require a little bit of match funding from partners, but what that shows is our commitment to helping small companies to grow and invest. And we look forward to making a significant number of grant awards over the coming months. In terms of peer support, one of the big things we've learned from businesses is, is not so much that they need money, although clearly that always helps, but for many uh, entrepreneurs in the region, it, it was about um, advice and support. And Costa Capital piloted a, uh, a peer support program last year. Our escalator program helped 70 uh, entrepreneurs within the region and had rave reviews. We're delighted that that's been adopted by government as a national standard now and been rolled out across the whole country. So we will be extending it to another 160 businesses this year, looking to support them uh, through peer learning. And we've just engaged with a, a commercial partner to make sure we do that to the highest possible standard. In all of this, we're working increasingly closely with government, with the uh, Department for Business in particular. And there's a lot more to come on some of the bigger issues uh, that business faces. That might be adapting to the, the terms of Britain's future trading relationship with the rest of the world or specific sector support, which comes forward in response to uh, COVID and the lockdown. And for all businesses on the call, I'd encourage you to get familiar with what we offer to uh, make sure that you're well in contact with Malcolm Braben and his excellent team and our 30 expert um, advisors who are out there who can offer tailored support in particular areas of, of need. Just run through um, for a couple more minutes, just on other successes over the year. Now, as you all know, one of the big functions of the LEP is to invest public money in the region. We have 275 million pounds of growth funding in nearly 100 projects. A really, really good picture there. Um, almost all of those projects are coming through on time and on budget. We're just supporting those who, who are struggling with some of their deadlines. We do all of this uh, with a real eye to transparency and a real eye to um, making sure that the projects are worth the money. 
we have to demonstrate that public money invested in this region gives a really strong return on investment for ministers. If you invest in a strong economy, it gets even stronger. And that's never been more true than at the moment. We're delighted that that argument is really getting traction with government in the context of COVID. So uh, the Getting Building Fund was announced at very short notice earlier in the year. Coastal Capital received 19.2 million pounds of funding, which is more than um, any other LEP in the south of England of our size. We're able to support a dozen projects from that. Now, I say a dozen projects in full knowledge that there's 120 other partners out there who submitted bids for funding and were unable to get funding. And we regret that. We're working very closely with you to make sure that um, business cases get sharper and we're able to make an even stronger pitch for money next time. And we look forward to doing that. On my final slide, I've talked a lot about infrastructure in the presentation so far. I think it's well worth saying that skills is probably the next major issue for the year ahead. Um, Francis Rutter will be on the panel in a second and we can talk about it a little bit more. But um, we are beginning a very significant piece of work on skills. We published our skills strategy and action plan last week, which you'll, you'll see illustrated on the slide here. And that's been developed by our skills advisory panel, which Francis leads and which brings together businesses, education providers and the public sector within the region. That's a different group of people to board members. That's people from uh, businesses with a particular interest and expertise and passion for skills development. And what we're going to do next is develop projects that help deliver uh, skills that are, make a workforce ready for employment in the challenge. You know, although I can't quite give you numbers yet, we do expect the unemployment situation in this region to become a real challenge over the coming months. That's true nationally and it's particularly true in our area. And our skills strategy is going to be a very, very important bedrock for responding to that. So we look forward to developing that further over the year ahead. That's the end of my presentation. I, I hope you found that interesting. And um, on, this, on that basis, I'm going to now bring my colleagues from the board onto the panel to take your questions. So the first person to join is Amanda Jones. And uh, I'll introduce Amanda very briefly. As Julie said, Amanda is um, one of our uh, board members from the Brighton Dome. Also delighted to welcome Councillor Mark Brunt. And Mark is the leader of Rygate and Banstead's Borough Council. And finally, uh, Francis Rutter. I've mentioned Francis already in the context of skills. Francis is the principal and chief exec of Nescott College in Epsom in Surrey. Francis, are you there? There seems to be a bit of a technical issue with Francis, but Julie, I'll, I'll hand over to you. The, the panel's assembled, ready to um, look at some of the questions. Great, thanks Jonathan. Um, so we've got three uh, pre-selected questions that were submitted before the event and uh, so we're going to kick off with those. Um, Fran's now with us, uh, brilliant, thank you. Um, so if we could go to the first question. So the first question, uh, I'm sure you can all see it on the screen but I'll read it out, is what plans does Coaster Capital have to take advantage of scale-up talent and wealth evacuate, I can't even say it now, and wealth evacuating London post-Covid? Jonathan, did you want to, to comment first on that and then perhaps we will bring others in? I think we're waiting for a couple of other panellists to come on screen as well. But Jonathan, perhaps if you kick off. Thanks ever so much. Um, so this is one of the big unknowns about what happens next in the economy. Um, we, we all read how uh, many businesses are not returning to their London offices. And I think there's a huge opportunity as a region to uh, incentivise some of them to move here. That's particularly because much of the London workforce already lives in the region. And I think it's a really interesting challenge to all uh, local authorities and business owners, and, and I think particularly landlords in the region, about how we can repurpose our commercial buildings to create a place that businesses might want to move to. I've already explained the vision for the area around Gatwick. You know, we, we think that should be seen as a commercial centre for the country. And there are great plans for business parks, whether that's in Hawley, in Horsham, in Burgess Hill and uh, Crawley, to, to attract businesses down. I think we want to see more and more of that. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it feels like an opportunity. Um, of course, we're in competition with other areas. That's the only other thing I'd say. Thank you. Any of the other board members want to come in there? 
Yeah, I'm happy to comment, Julie. And um, what strikes me very much is, and probably you wouldn't be surprised at me saying this really from my background, but I think it's going to be more important than ever for our towns and cities to be really developing their cultural strategies and creating places that actually, because I think the businesses will also follow that talent and we want to attract that talent and create towns and cities that are really vibrant places and engaging places to live and to work. And I think by doing that, it will increasingly make our own towns and, and cities uh, really, really attractive to, to the talent that, as you say, is, is, is coming out of London. Thanks, Amanda. The, the other observation I'd, I'd make, um, I think Jonathan uh, referenced, um, you know, that we have seen uh, a number of, of startups uh, over the last six, seven months. And I think what we also need to do, we were talking to, to colleagues in Croydon yesterday, is how can we look at where there are particular sectors uh, or niches that have set up, for example, in, in Brighton, and how can we share some of those ideas for looking at supporting business startups and scale-ups more broadly across the region. I think it's about that culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next question, but fear not, fellow panellists, you will all have a, a chance to speak. Uh, so the second question um, is, please explain how Coaster Capital uh, links from Bayes to local stakeholders like local authorities and business associations. I might ask you to initially reflect, Jonathan, and, and then probably bring, bring Mark in, if that's all right. Thank you, Julie. Um, so that's a fundamental part of my job. We, we have uh, 15 local authorities in the area, uh, all directly elected, clearly vitally important that we understand the priorities of elected members all across the whole area. So a, a big part of the LEPS role is to talk to that. that during lockdown, one of the benefits of lockdown has been that we've all got much better at Zoom. So I've been having uh, calls with every leader in the local area uh, once a month is really helpful as well as very close relationships with uh, individuals looking at the priorities in their in their particular towns and and, dist and districts business associations are also um, vital and I've talked about the growth hub I think the growth hubs one of the first ports of call for business associations so Malcolm and the team know the FSB well they know the bids they know the chambers and they're talking all the time about issues on the ground for local members what we really do is pull all that information together and then pitch it into government so that government understands the challenges we face. And the slides I've just shared show you one of the ways we do that. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Mark, it would be really useful to, to get your perspective from the local authority. And, and, I, and I think one, one of the key things that the, uh, the LEP has been doing is about breaking down the barriers and the silos uh, between the different groups. Um, I think uh, traditionally um, we've had a, had, had a view of the different roles of those different, um, so the, the role of the local authority, um, um, the role of local business associations. But I think what we're seeing, and particularly COVID highlights this, is that actually the lines that we traditionally saw are blurring. And I think, that, I think that's, that's, that's good because actually, if I look at my role as a leader of a local authority, um, I may not directly have um, statutory responsibility for driving the economy in my area, but, I, but clearly I do have a, have a role in that and a, and a part in that role. And what we're seeing through the LEP is, and I think this is a greater role for the LEP going forward, is to provide that coordination, to bring together those, the, the local authorities, to bring the, the business associations and the SMEs into those discussions. And I think the, the LEP is in a unique position in this region to do that because everybody else has their defined silos, their defined boundaries, the LEP doesn't. And I think that's a really great opportunity for the LEP. And I think the other thing that we should all be um, uh, um, conversant of is that there is a big debate going on within local government about what the future for structures our local governments are. And I think the LEP has a really clear role in influencing those outcomes because we need to make sure that the way that local, local authorities deliver services and manage their assets and support our businesses and our communities is of key interest to the LEP. And I think the LEP has a very, very unique perspective to input into that discussion. Thanks, Mark. Um, Fran, I mentioned uh, earlier uh, the role that you've taken on uh, on behalf of LEPs from a, from a skills perspective and, and being conscious of that sort of link between central government and, and working with the LEP. It'd be good to get, get your thoughts on that. Thanks, Julie. So, yeah, really important um, role there for the LEPs to play um, and have that voice feeding in. 
it's very focused at the moment around task and finish groups, so quick results, um, feeding back by the end of September. I'm pretty focused, I have to say, on the Kickstart program at the moment. So really seeing how that can be um, engineered and motivated locally and get people really engaged with that quickly to take um, people on for uh, work placements for six months periods um, and improve their chances of um, getting uh, work and uh, employment afterwards. Uh, so yeah, really important that we get that voice up to central government. I think the Kickstart programme is going to be an excellent opportunity. Um, I'm delighted that in, in my day job, Chichester College Group are going to be partnering uh, with Sussex Chambers of Commerce and, and others um, in terms of that intermediary role, in terms of getting businesses um, in touch with those young people and, and giving those opportunities. So again, another great example of, of new ways of collaborating. Um, I'm going to move us on to our next question. which should seamlessly appear in a minute. Um, so and it's even more seamless that it's on training as well. So uh, retraining uh, adult employment uh, is a focus, but how do we ensure um, aspiration of young people with regards to STEM skills remains a priority? Fran, can, can you maybe continue in the, in the vein of what we were talking about before and, and pick up on that? Yeah, sure. So Jonathan referred to um, the really diverse economy that we've got in the coast capital region and the need to um, invest in all of those areas. So I suppose my, my question is to throw the question back a little bit. Is it STEM or is it STEAM? I think we need to include um, arts in there. And again, Jonathan's reference, that sort of creative uh, Sussex coastal region and, uh, and also a very strong cultural region. So I think it's STEAM perhaps rather than STEM. In terms, so that's the, the, that's the what. In terms of the how, uh, I think it starts with really good advice and guidance in schools. So the creation of the Careers Hub, which has just um, gone live in the north of the coast capital region, 20, uh, 35 schools and colleges engaged in that really important um, starting point. Um, but then also important that we've got business much closer to education, I think an education much closer to business. And we're working with STEAM employers to uh, generate projects and programmes that can really enthuse and um, motivate young people to stay uh, or to train in those areas and, um, and, and create employment in those areas going forward. So that really strong enterprise advisor network, getting the business into into education and getting education into business at a much earlier stage really critical thanks uh, amanda it'd be really good to get your reflections in terms of from, from an employer's perspective what what you're seeing very much julie um obviously really keen to you know to develop that aspiration in in a number of different ways um it encouraged by a lot of the the talent that is coming forward but keen to I guess really look at making sure that the system is developing young people um, in, in all of their talents really um, and specifically around creative thinking. So we're doing a lot of work in looking at you know, the impact in arts and heritage and those types of skills. Um, Bright, Brighton Hove, sorry, uh, Brighton Dome, Brighton Festival, we, um, we teach over 6,000 kids you know, in terms of our music services across, across the region um, and really looking at you know, how developing at an early stage, developing those creative skills leads to that innovation and leads to that innovation that I think, you know, we're, we're aiming for and looking for in our young adults, bringing them into employment in all sectors. That's great. Jonathan, Mark, you know, wanted to add? I, I, may I say something about um, the work we do with the Careers and Enterprise Company, Julie? I think that's really important. I, the question focuses on how we help young people get the right ambition, you know, the right aspiration for it. And, and we've been running our... Um, Prison enterprise company work now, which we call our enterprise uh, coordinators work for for five years. One of the big developments just in the last few months is is upgrading that work. So the board's decided to invest more money. Government has match funded that to give us even more money, and we have a careers hub now, as Francis says, focusing um, particularly on East Surrey and the parts of West Sussex closer to the airport initially, and then it will expand further. Um, and what that careers hub will do is just really focus on on kids and their aspirations and knowledge of the labour market. So the key to keeping kids enthused about work is to make them understand what the local opportunities are. 
the very last thing we need in this region is the next generation thinking, oh, well, it's been great growing up in Surrey and Sussex, but, you know, I'm going to move to Manchester or I'm going to move to um, uh, Sheffield because that's where the action is. You know, we need them to stay in the area. And so th that starts at a young age by getting them excited about what local employment offers. I think it then relates to the, the, the type of region we have, you know, how the cultural scene works, how the how the evening economy works, how the, you know, how the green space is accessible to them. It's a competitive world. And I think if we're going to retain a young, vibrant workforce, we need to work a little bit harder to get them infused and engaged in the local labour market. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I'd also add one of Coast Capital's investments is in the new STEM facility at Crawley College, uh, which will be opening um, early in 2021. And a key part of that will be to encourage, enthuse and inspire young people uh, about careers uh, in STEM. Um, perhaps I think I've probably, Fran, should rename it the STEAM Centre, but a uh, good point in terms of making sure that, that we include the arts uh, within that. Um, what I'm going to probably do is um, move us now on to the opportunity to answer some questions uh, that have come up uh, during the course of the morning in the Q&A box. Please do remember to upvote questions uh, to help us prioritise. Um, and also just to remind you, as I said at the start, we can't answer everything, but we will be going through the chats and questions afterwards and providing a full and detailed response on, on the website. So, uh, Jonathan, um, what are you seeing in the text box? What, where do you want to take us first? I'm seeing 27 questions, Julie, and I'll just reiterate your point about upvoting. So if everyone who's looking at this likes a question, please click on the little thumb, because then it moves to the top of the list. I, I can't read all the 27 questions at once, but I will go with the top one on the list, which is from Jeremy Taylor. And Jeremy asks, uh, what plans can we share to promote international trade attract inward investment and attract new businesses to the region? That's a very good question. How, how do we communicate the region on an international stage? Um, I'll give you a, um, a simple answer, which is we need to do a lot more than we have at the moment. And we need to think about two things really. What, what are the private sector brands in the region and how do we prioritize them? And then do we need to have a, a, a better regional inward investment strategy than we do at the moment? I think that is absolutely a question for, for the LEP and it's a question for all our partners going forward. You know, some of our private sector brands are really strong, not least Gatwick Airport. Or we could talk about the English wine industry or you could talk about Brighton as a, as a global city. Um, but we need to get a lot better about all the other places in the region and, and the opportunities for businesses of investing in, in our towns as well. I think Mark has had a... Jonathan, yeah, Mark. So I think I think one of the um, one of the crucial things, if we really want to play um, as a region on the international um, uh, scene, is really to be very to get very clear about our our, our branding and what we are. Um, uh, we, we talk a lot about things like the Northern Powerhouse, and you know everyone knows where Manchester is. And, and I think one of the things that as a let we need to look at is you know is Coast Capital a clear brand that people understand. People understand, they, they've heard of Gatwick, they've probably heard of Brighton and maybe some of the other places in between. But we, you know, for really to be able to play on an international stage and to show that this region is a competitive, exciting, innovative region, we need to really think about our branding and about how we present that. And that may mean that we need to challenge ourselves on what we call ourselves, Coast Capital. Does that, does that tell businesses where we are and what we are? Which coast? Uh, which capital you know where you live it could be you know is it the welsh capital is it the scottish capital where are we so i think we need to look at that if we really want to take a serious role um, in attracting investment internationally we've perfectly set up infrastructure wise to do that but i think we need to work on our branding great thank you mark and thank you jeremy a really great question to, to kick us off um jonathan are you happy to yeah, so we have a question from Shona Campbell uh, at the top of the list now. Shona asks, Shona's from the University of Brighton, I believe. Shona asks, how do you see Coast to Capital competing for government funding in the context of levelling up? Looking ahead to post-Brexit funding, we need to make sure we have access to funds and to create an ecosystem which is going to be more than the sum of its parts. I think that's an excellent question and uh, one that I'm very, very conscious of. In, the government was elected with an explicit agenda uh, an explicit manifesto of levelling up and an explicit pitch to uh, towns in the north and the midlands 
who haven't had an equal access to economic growth over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years. And we're in competition with them. And, and I think it's fair to say the wind is in their sails. We'll, we'll all appreciate that. So the way to uh, do that, and I hope that comes across in the slides that I've just shared, is to be uh, concise and ambitious in what we say. You know, people uh, in, in the national environment haven't necessarily heard of every single town in our area. They haven't necessarily heard of the, the fine distinction between um, Shoreham and Worthing, for example, or between Epsom and Leatherhead. We need to make sure that we're, we're, we're pitching ourselves on a bigger canvas so that they can understand it. And the key message to get across is this is a region disproportionately affected by COVID. You know, we've, we've grown well for 50 years. We've been a net contributor to the national economy. Um, we're in, likely to be in trouble over the, over the coming months. And that means we need support because the government can't deliver its agenda without a very strong and successful Southeast of England. So that would be my answer to it. And it's a lot of hard work for all of us, not, not least me. But thank you for the question, Shona. I think uh, Mark wants to come in, but just before he does, I, I just want to re-emphasize a, a point I made earlier. I think it makes it all the more important that we're speaking with one voice. We're, we're looking at what are the priorities that we need uh, as a region and coming together. And I've been really encouraged over the last few months by regular calls with our MPs, with our local authority leaders, with businesses, and we need to continue that to make sure that ask and that voice is consistent, backed up by data and backed up by a proven ability to deliver. Um, Mark, good to get your thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think the big risk for us in, as a region is um, the view from central government is, well, the, uh, the southeast of England is always complaining, but actually they always deliver. So why would we, you know, why would we want to invest there? And I think we need to really give a very compelling case of how um, uh, an invest, a strong investment in this region will deliver rapid uh, economic in, uh, development in, in, in to the country and to the region and to the treasury. So I think we do have to think as, uh, as ministers do. Um, they want to see value. Um, we need to be very clear on, on our brand and our perspective on how we can turn an investment from central government into uh, economic growth. Um, because there is a view that, well, it's a southeast and there's always plenty of money there and it always gets done so really are we going to spend our money there and i think we've got to really show that strong investment here will deliver strong economic growth which will drive the country forward thanks mark um jonathan um you happy to pull out another question absolutely um so top of the pops at the moment is simon matthews and simon asks uh, simon says i've heard a lot about brighton the coastal economy and the m23 corridor and gatwick Coast Capital has a thriving rural based economy with 15,000 businesses, 250,000 residents and nearly 100,000 employees. How will Coast Capital reflect this in your future strategies and interventions? Um, and I think the, the short answer to that is by focusing on the issues which are most relevant in the rural economy to the bigger picture that I've just described. And the good news, Simon, is there are many, many examples of highly relevant issues from the rural economy, which, which we intend to promote. So if I talk about the um, sector slide, you'll have seen in that a very significant uh, focus on rural sectors and also, frankly, on, on businesses that you wouldn't expect to be in the rural economy, like manufacturers, but who, who actually are. There's also a very important angle on skills in the rural economy. And also, I think we need to recognise, when I talk about the demographic challenges for the region, that the rural economy has a big part to play in supporting the wider region. You know, the extent to which uh, the rural economy allows houses to be built is the sort of place that younger people want to live in and provides uh, easy to access jobs and work and proper transport facilities. Those are all a big part and, and just as important as doing the same thing around Gatwick or in Brighton. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you. Jonathan. And Simon, um, yeah, great question. I'm really pleased to have you uh, on the call today. Um, with reference to the skills side, um, Fran, would you like to, to come in there and talk about the, the skills angle in terms of rural communities? While we're waiting to see if uh, we've lost Fran temporarily, I'm happy to, to pick that up. Um, 
again, in, in my day job, one of uh, the colleges um, within the group is Brinsbury College. Uh, and one of our biggest challenges is around accessibility to, to the college, getting, getting students uh, and learners of all, all ages to be able to access a site uh, that doesn't, isn't well served by, by public transport. So there's undoubtedly uh, an accessibility issue. Um, but actually, um, some of the changes that have happened over the last six, seven months in different ways that people are learning using technology, while sometimes none of that replaces the face-to-face -face interaction, um, I think we need to look at how we're delivering skills, how we're working in ways to ensure that, that rural communities are, are able to, to access not just skills in terms of in colleges, whether it's skills to support uh, business support, business advice, and I think there's an opportunity to, to build on some of these different ways of working that have become, dare I say it, what's felt like the new norm over the last uh, six months to, to ensure we're able to, to engage in that way. Um, Amanda, Mark, did you want to come in at all? I'm not sure if Fran is back. Yeah, I'm ha happy to, Julie. Um, the one word that keeps coming back for me is connectivity, because I think that word means something entirely different now, really, after the last six months, doesn't it? And for me, it's very much about you know, making sure that in, in those rural areas, we're helping the areas become places very much, as I said earlier, where people want to live. And I think we'll find a lot more. It's connected to the very, very first point, I think, today, about particularly people coming out of London, you know, identifying um, those that already live in our rural areas and those that potentially might be considering to do that. Um, the connectivity and the LEPs, um, the importance that we are putting very much on our fibre investment and you know the, the items that Jonathan um, talked about earlier and the initiative there. I think for me that's going to be one of the really, really key, one of the really key steps that you know we can we can continue to work with with partners and ensure that when we say a connected region, as Jonathan said earlier, we're not just talking about transport links. We're also talking about absolutely the best connectivity um, possible to open up. And it was my thought, I think, on that earlier question about, I think it was Jeremy Taylor's question about, you know, being attractive internationally. I think we're going to find a huge amount of large companies, worldwide companies, saying that, you know, you, you don't have to live or work in a certain place. And actually, our connectivity is going to really, really push our, our workforce and our initiatives out and, and make them much more accessible and actually bring you know, the jobs will be created because we're so well connected and we're providing the people who are well connected in the place that they want to live. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to pull out another question? From so me? Gavin Stewart uh, has asked a very good question. Thank you, Gavin. Gavin asks, what scope is there to specifically support our town and city centres? Uh, retail, leisure and hospitality are a huge employer within the region, albeit lower level jobs, but still crucial to our regional economy. And he's absolutely right. And I think um, one of the reasons that we are disproportionately affected by the current economic crisis is, is a preponderance of retail, leisure and hospitality jobs in the region. You know, we, we not only have uh, 26 town centres within the region, 26 urban centres that, that fall within the coastal capital area, um, but we have very significant retail and leisure industries around the airport with the hotels and, uh, and retail that, that that the airport supports and all of those are significantly affected. Then there is some cause for optimism, which is that the, um, the towns, the smaller towns and uh, um, more local communities are actually rebounding really well. And I was talking to the FSB yesterday and FSB reported really strong growth and really optimistic view from some of their members in, in some of the Surrey towns. Um, but clearly the bigger places are, are at risk and this is an, a sector which is going to undergo huge change in the future. I think this really comes back to the point that I made in the presentation about um, skills, adult retraining in particular, and also the importance of um, diversifying our economic base as much as we can. You know, it may be that someone who's worked in, in retail or leisure or hospitality for recent years is going to have to retrain. And the key thing that we need to do is make sure that there's well-paid easy to find jobs in new sectors that, that'll bring, that'll help, help them move forward. And that is particularly true in the towns around Gatwick, I have to say. Um, and it's also true on the coast and, and down on the coast, I'm particularly hopeful that the tourism sector is gonna be able to go from strength to strength uh, in, in response to the challenge. But we'll come on to another question about that in a second. Thanks.
such a key question and I think all of our panelists um, can, can contribute real value. And I'm very conscious of time so perhaps if I, if I ask uh, Fran, Amanda and Mark to just uh, a couple of sentences with, with the views from their perspective. Um, Fran, kicking off with you, I think you're back with us. Yeah, sorry I lost you for a bit there. <laughs> so Fran, good to, to get your thought in terms of the, the skills impact, what, what you're seeing in the sort of Epsom, Yule uh, and sort of wider uh, Surrey area from, from the skills side. So uh, we're seeing a massive uptake actually in 16 to 18 demand for FE. Um, we've yet to really feel that coming through at an HE level. Um, but what we are expecting to see are um, adults who are changing their place in the workforce, maybe completely reskilling, uh, going into something um, completely different. And certainly in the part of the region that we're in, economically, they have the ability to do that. And that won't necessarily be the case uh, across the piece. Um, we've put in place a rapid uh, recovery skills program uh, for people who need to reskill, upskill now. And we're seeing a huge amount of interest in that locally. And uh, I know other colleges you're doing, you're doing something similar. Uh, so the demand is, is very definitely there. But I think this is going to have an extremely long tail on it. Great, thank you. Amanda, Mark, just very quickly, because I want to squeeze in one more question afterwards, just, just some observations from you. Mark, are you happy to, to talk from your perspective? Yeah, so I think very, very simplistically, um, uh, our towns and, and, uh, and city centres um, need footfall. So everything we do, it should be about how do we retain footfall and, and bring footfall into our town centres. Um, and, and some of that is about ensuring that, uh, that we try to control where possible the conversion of office offices to uh, to residential because if you offices bring people in at lunchtime um, I think and it was almost an answer I wanted to give to the very first question which is the opportunity with people moving out of London I don't think we're going to see that going back so I think that uh, employers and individuals are going to be looking for workspaces within our town centres where they can operate uh, remotely for two or three days a week and uh, the, the trick really for us is to find them, uh, find those opportunities, those spaces. And, you know, if, you, if I look in my own town, in, so look in Rygate, we have a number of banks that have closed their buildings and they're empty. Now, some of those buildings could be repurposed for those micro units to bring people, to provide people a workspace, but also bring that business back into the town centres and provide the, the, the lunchtime, the daytime economy uh, that will keep our, our town centres vibrant. Uh, Amanda, quickly, good to get your thoughts. Yeah, I'll say very quickly. Interestingly, um, I heard the other day actually that Churchill Square, for example, in Brighton, their footfall actually at the minute is already at 80%, back to 80% of what it would have been pre-COVID. Um, but the point I think that's coming out of Brighton quite, quite often is that actually for us, it isn't um, just about footfall. What's really important is that actually the footfall is coming, but they're not actually spending because there isn't actually the provision, the economic provision for them when they're there. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is that, and I'm using Brighton, forgive me as an example, but one of the re reasons for that is that, you know, our complete culture and arts community across the country is in distress. So one of the things I think, you know, Coast Capital can help with is, as Jonathan said earlier, continuing to work with government to look and lobby for whether we can see um, sector specific uh, solutions to that. Um, and then thirdly, um, on our wider and, and thinking much further ahead, I think we've mentioned it before, it's about our tourism, it's our branding, it's about getting that message right, it's about working together. Um, I discovered, for example, only a few weeks ago that Lawrence Bresch, who used to be the most senior marketing individual at Visit Britain at the time of the London Olympics, he's a, he's a resident in our, in our, um, in our region. Um, and we've brought him on board at Sussex Pass. We want to be developing all of our activities, all of the, um, the real assets that we have across the, across the region. And I think those, for me, those are the three Things really that I Great. Would. Thank you, Amanda. We're not actually going to be able to go to any further questions because we've run out of time. But but I have I did pick up one that, that Jeff Alexander had had asked, which was um, uh, I'm paraphrasing because I haven't got the Q and A up. But there's been a lot of discussion about SMEs and startups and not forgetting the important role that, that our corporates and large businesses play. Jeff couldn't agree more. Um, we continue to work really closely with those large, significant employers. Um, Things like the bid for the Institute of Technology will be an excellent example to do more in that area. 
Um, so we are out of time. Uh, my thanks to um, my fellow board members uh, and to you all for such excellent questions. Um, can I ask um, Jonathan, Amanda, Mark and Fran to turn their screens and microphones off now? Uh, and just um, in the last couple of minutes really to, to draw to a close um, today's meeting and, and I'm just going to draw it to a close really with some thank yous. Um, first of all to our venue Plus X. Um, I have been blown away by this venue today. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, my thanks to, to Paul for allowing us to be here today uh, and I can't wait to have a, a tour around later. Uh, and to our technical hosts at uh, Platform 9, especially Emily and Tony, uh, you have made this uh, so much easier for us all, so thank you. To my fellow board directors uh, for their support and interaction, hugely appreciated. Um, to Jonathan, for your outstanding presentation, leadership and support. Um, to Katie, uh, Helen, uh, for their leadership and creativity in putting on today's event. I'm giving a special mention to Jake from Coaster Capital, that if you could see in the room I'm in, he's been providing me with moral support and cups of tea all morning. Um, and to the whole Coaster Capital team for their ongoing commitment, passion and impact. And lastly, to all of you, for your time, interaction, commitment to working with us so that we can support the region and its future. Please keep in touch, but more than anything else, please keep safe. Thank you.